So let's look at what James Naramore has to say about this passage. So this is from his book, um, The World Without a Self, okay? Page 98. He writes, near the bottom of 98, A number of passages, like the accounts of the crowds watching the Prime Minister's car and the sky-riding aeroplane, are a mixture of indirect interior monologue and omniscient comment. But consider the curious imagery Mrs. Wolfe develops when Peter Walsh drops off to sleep on a park bench seated next to an elderly nurse. I'm going to take another drink. The Grey Nurse resumed her knitting as Peter Walsh on the hot seat beside her began snoring. In her gray dress, moving her hands indefatigably yet quietly, she seemed like the champion of the rights of sleepers, like one of those spectral presences which rise in the twilight in woods made of sky and branches. The solitary traveler, haunter of lanes, disturber of ferns, and devastator of great hemlock plants, looking up, suddenly sees the giant figure at the end of the ride, end quote. So this is the beginning of the passage that I just read in the previous video. <clears throat> this is what Nairmore says. The author and the style here strongly suggests a ghostly presence that is not Peter, who it may be speaking for him in some way, goes on to discuss the vague yearnings and frustrations of the solitary traveler, who may well be Peter's vision of himself. The passage in no doubt related to Peter's dream is in no is no doubt related to Peter's dreams, but in exactly what way? Is it an evocation of the unconscious, a more or less exact rendition of the images that are going through Peter's mind? When Peter awakes, we are told he has been dreaming of some scene, some room, some past, but this does not suggest anything like what we have just read. Or is it the association with some past hidden in the symbols of the dream? To what extent does the solitary traveler represent Peter Walsh, and to what extent is he simply an archetypal male sleeper? <clears throat> the rhetorical questions, so that's Naramore, the rhetorical questions are not often uh, effective means of argumentation, especially in short papers. I always t often tell students not to rely on rhetorical questions for the, to make their points. Naramore uses them here as a way to equip us as we go back to the passage he has just cited. Though he could have offered an interpretation of specific phrases from the passage, Naramore attempts instead to treat this passage as an occasion to problematize, that is, to worry over the very thing he wants to nail down in this book chapter, how the perspective of the novel works, and how it, how it often frustrates our attempts to categorize it either as interior and direct monologue or as omniscient third person or even as stream of consciousness. Though he does not walk us sentence by sentence through the passage itself, he still prompts us to read it again and again with the questions he poses in mind. His point is that we are not equipped to answer these questions, that when we attend to the narrative perspective, which is what interests him, the novel leaves us at a loss, something that will be important for him when he turns his attention later in the chapter to the greater ideas of Mrs. Dalloway itself, namely, quote, the problem of death, the ultimate separation, for, uh, um, and from one point of view, the ultimate confirmation of the separateness of things, end quote. That's from page 102. All right. So that's Naramore, okay? Um, we should point out that Naramore only quotes a little bit from that passage, and that what matters to him is the perspective itself, right? Trying to pin down who is speaking thus, for whom are they speaking, to whom can we attribute these images, and in some sense we're left at a complete loss as to what to do with this passage, okay? The fact that this occurs early in Naramore's argument, or, or actually it's not that early, now that I'm thinking about it. No, it's not all that early, actually. It's kind of late. Kind of late, about 10 pages away from the end of his, uh, end of his argument. He's nevertheless beginning to um, 
transition into uh, the part of the essay where he'll connect up the important thematic implications of the difficulties that the narrative perspective of Mrs. Dalloway poses to us, okay? And, and so this example drawn from the Solitary Traveler episode, which I read in the last video, is one of the ways in which he's beginning to make that transition, that important transition. Okay. So what about J. Hillis Miller? Of, uh, 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 so if we turn to page 178 of that chapter, So near the very beginning of the chapter, but only about three pages in. Whew, okay, so consider J. Hillis Miller's approach, which is also invested in what this moment in the novel suggests about narrative perspective. Okay, this is page 178, the paragraph right at the top. Quote, nothing exists outside us except a state of mind, end quote. The seemingly casual and somewhat inscrutable statement is reported from the thoughts of the solitary traveler in Peter Walsh's dream, as Peter sits snoring on a bench in Regent's Park. The sentence provides an initial clue to the mode of existence of the narrator of Mrs. Dalloway. The narrator is that state of mind, which exists outside the characters, and of which they can never be directly aware. Though they are not aware of it, it is aware of them. This state of mind surrounds them, encloses them, pervades them, knows them from within. It is present to them all at all time, all the times and places of their lives. It gathers those times and places together in the moment. The narrator is that, quote, something central which permeates, end quote. The, quote, something warm which breaks up the surfaces, end quote. A power of union and penetration which Clarissa Dalloway lacks. Or to vary the metaphor, the narrator possesses the irresistible and subtle energy of the bell of St. Margaret's, striking half past eleven. Like that sound, the narrator, quote, glides into the recesses of the heart and buries itself, end quote. It is, quote, something alive which wants to confide itself, to disperse itself, to be with a tremor of delight at rest, end quote. Expanding to enter into the inmost recesses of each heart, the narrator encloses all in a reconciling embrace. <clears throat> Instead of quoting a large chunk of the scene, Miller extracts one sentence from it and reads it as a moment of self-reference. Remember, this is one of the tropes of deconstructive criticism. Note that Miller does not just cite the passage and then tell us, there, that's how the narrator works. Using the final phrase from the sentence over and over again, he slowly unpacks what he wants us, his readers, to take from this brief passage. More than this, when we situate Miller's paragraph in the context of the surrounding paragraphs, we see that this one sentence is an important transition point. In the sentences closing the previous paragraph, Miller offers a basic thesis statement. So this is at the top of 178. The novel depends on the presence of a narrator who remembers all and who has a power of resurrecting the past in her narration. In Mrs. Dalloway, Narration is repetition as the raising of the dead. Excuse me. In the sentences beginning the next paragraph, we see Miller beginning the implications of his argument. If the narrator is, as he develops in the paragraph I just read, an all-encompassing state of mind that exists outside its characters, then it follows that a whole series of problems result, namely the, pro the, relation the problems of the relations between the mind of the narrator and the mind of Wolf's characters, as well as the relations between the various minds of, care of the characters themselves, which leads us to the further problem of oscillation of oscillations between access and separation, and eventually, for Miller's argument, between life and death as well. These are the very problems that Miller will track in the novel throughout the remainder of his deconstructivist reading. So you see that in his account of Miller's of Peter's dream, excuse me, Miller does not interpret a huge chunk of text but he does isolate one sentence as particularly significant and takes his time explaining how and why it is crucial, a crucial moment of self-reference for the commencement and progression of his interpretation. Should also point out that at the end of the paragraph, he sort of weaves in other, other short quotations th th uh, that are found in other parts of the novel, right? That have nothing to do with Peter's dream, but rather uh, have some kind of um, 
symbolic or imagistic relationship to, to the phrase he quotes from Peter. Okay. All right, so I want us to conclude with a consideration of Daniel Ferrier's approach to this passage, which is much more in-depth than either Naramore's or Miller's. Um, and because it'll take us a little while to get through it, I'm going to stop here um, and, and, and uh, take it up in the final video of this lecture series on close reading. Okay.